Hi, everyone. This is uh, Jerry Vanich from the Fred Hutch in Seattle, Washington. And what I'm going to talk to you today about is essential molecular monitoring, um, focusing again on the low and middle income countries. So to put this into perspective, and this will become very important at the end of the talk, is cyber kinases have completely revolutionized the natural history of CML. So that in the developing world now, um, patients with CML with chronic phase can expect an almost normal life expectancy on the, this is a data from the Swedish Cancer Registry, uh, males 55 on the left and females uh, 55 on the right, CML. You can see as we got into the age of TKIs in the 2000s, the life expectancy just rose dramatically. So it's, it's really a, a profound victory of, of, of modern medicine. And we'll show how that's impacted uh, into the low and uh, middle income countries as we go through this talk. So you know, my lab studies, um, for the lack of a better uh, term, the biology of luck, trying to decide who responds to therapy and not. But really, um, the real luck in cancer is, is where and how you were born. Um, this is a, a physician, actually, who's uh, going to get a B cerebral test done. And it's gonna take him a few days to get to the testing lab. And he's, he's doing that because he's gonna be uh, working with a program from the Max Foundation that if he gets tested for be able, he can get a free life-saving drug for life. So this brings us to the question of how do you do monitoring in low resource settings? And historically, we've tried this in all of these ways. Um, when we first started doing this, we started to do, try to introduce homebrew PCRs uh, from academic centers to local institutions. And the pro of that approach is that you know you have an assay that works. Um, the con is that it takes actually a lot of technical training, expensive machines, expensive reagents, and then this just didn't, didn't work. Um, the next is, has been highly successful is using user-friendly PCR technology, uh, for instance, the Cepheid cartridge system. Uh, the pro is that it takes much less technical training the standardized reagents. Uh, the con is these is, uh, machines can be expensive to buy and maintain. Cartridges are relatively expensive. And then there's the idea of shipping blood to specialized centers. The pro there is that you have a specialized center doing the assay. The con is that it's very expensive and samples can be compromised, um, reliance on others, etc. cetera. Uh, for example, to send blood uh, by air mail from uh, Africa to Seattle is roughly 500 bucks. So it's, it's not a real sustainable method to do. So to get into this story, this is Pat Garcia Gonzalez, the head of the Max Foundation. And this is uh, when she was first offering diagnostic text to Sub-Saharan Africa by the Cepheid method. So what I wanna do is go back and, and, and explain where this method came from, because it has a rather interesting history uh, that shows really the, the power of circumstance. Uh, if nothing else. So my involvement with the Max Foundation uh, came through this gentleman on the right. Um, he was working with the Max Foundation to set up their computers about 20 years ago. Um, and Pat was lamenting that she was making connections with countries, um, but she could find no way to do b able testing to get them uh, so they would be uh, get drug from the, the drug companies. And this gentleman said, well, you, uh, you have to go talk to Jerry over at the Hutch. Well, fortunately, the Max Foundation is also based in Seattle. Um, this guy knew about me and Beast Able because he had CML and I transplanted him 10 years before this picture was going. So that's just a, a matter of enormous circumstance. The next set of circumstances uh, came with this uh, outing. You may not remember this, but there was a series of anthrax attacks just after the 9-11 attacks in New York. Um, several people died of this. These are the envelopes that anthrax was sent to various senators and TV uh, personalities. Um, and shortly after this happened, a company called, and this is uh, basically the tracking, uh, how it went from the Brentwood Library through the Hamilton uh, Postal Service into the various outlets of the NBC Post and the like. Because of this, there was actually a complete um, shortage of Cipro tablets. Uh, in the United States, we have this uh, festival called Halloween at the end of October. And uh, my wife and I dressed up as uh, Cipro tablets because it was the, uh, the thing of the day. The other circumstance here is my softball team, the Killer Fleas. Um, so when the anthrax happened, 
a company called Cepheid started off as a bioterrorism country company. And they developed a system of doing automated PCRs. Um, all the testing of mail is now done by Cepheid machines, but they developed basically all of the, uh, the different bioterrorism capabilities. Um, they came to our lab in the early uh, 2000s uh, with the idea of maybe develop, getting into the cancer space. And I, and I thought that, well, BCR would be a perfect space to do this in. And the guy in gray down beside me there, his name is Brett Helton. It turns out he and his wife were uh, engineers at Cepheid. She was coming up to Washington to do a postdoc in nanotechnology. He didn't have a job. So I convinced Cepheid to put him in my lab for a number of years uh, where he would do basically all the development of the B-serial cartridge system. Uh, here's just another circumstance. Brett's still with us to this day. And this is what happened. We developed this, this cartridge, which um, really revolutionized the testing in low and low-income countries because at the same time, the WHO was putting this machine in places at greatly subsidized prices because you get in this machine, you could also do cartridge testing for TB, HIV, and the like. So we kind of rode, rode the coattails and followed the uh, WHO into all of these countries and got Cepheid involved. They were great partners and we were able to start doing these variable testing. Here's a graph of the, the, the testing and showing the first test in Ethiopia and how in just a number of years, the number of tests uh, skyrocketed and this basically paralleled all through the uh, Africa and Asia where in South America where these tests were being offered. And this is, um, a uh, person in my lab, Jordan, uh, doing testing in Uzbekistan. Uh, the people on the bottom are people who came um, for days, only by train, like to be tested um, at, at the capital because if they did get tested, uh, they would basically get free tyrosine kinase for life. This is now the map of all the gene expert uh, uh, testing stations in the world. As you can see, it covers a fairly big swath. But there's plenty of places um, that can't get these tests by simply because they don't have uh, Cepheid machines or because you know, they may not have electricity and the like. Um, and so we embarked on another more practical way to do testing. Um, this is uh, Amy and Jordan again from our lab. The big bag they have is they've made a dress out of is a courier bag. This was filled with dry ice from Africa. It had one little tube of blood in it. And this was just showing the absurdity of this. And so we first started to do testing um, instead of by scent blood, but by on saliva. Then we got the idea of doing it on blood. And it took us some time until we found a way that you could basically store uh, blood on paper uh, for a long period of time. And then you could actually batch samples. And instead of sending one blood sample as fast as you can, you could uh, save up a week's worth of clinic samples and send you know, 20, 50 uh, samples um, for a fraction of the price. So how we did this was we did an experiment with, uh, with um, Sue uh, Brantford in Adelaide, where she would take samples and run them uh, immediately on the cepheid uh, acid. We would, uh, she would also spot samples uh, onto these cards and then they would send it um, to us by snail mail. And as you can see here in the envelope, 68 cents to send a lot, um, as opposed to $500 by air courier. This is the paper in blood basically showing that in the XY axis, these things lined up amazingly well. The gray area is MMR. So if you get enough spots, you can even go down below MMR. And on the right, it shows that you can also do actually able sequencing for tyrosine kinase domains uh, with a fair amount of, amount of accuracy. So this is an example of how you can get this blood even from a fingerprint. This is a, a patient from the Philippines uh, who basically had a diabetic needle and you basically had a couple of pokes and we can get blood that way without having to use syringes. And this just kind of shows an update. Um, this is from a, a New York Times article that we've gone in. Uh, we now have, this is a little bit old, we now have none uh, on this program called Spot on CML, um, testing on a thousand patients from, uh, from at least 40 countries. Um, so we can actually get, um, you know, testing out now to pretty much anywhere on the, on the world where we can collect blood. So how do we get these tests to more people uh, faster and more direct, uh, quicker, cheaper? Um, so things that are being worked on is trying to teach spot testing to other centers. Uh, so they all just have come here, developing cheaper assays, developing point of care assays, 
and getting better ways to acquire samples. So here's one of the major problems. This is the world at, at uh, night, and you can see large areas have no light whatsoever, which means they have uh, no population with electricity. So the WHO has come up with these um, new standards for diagnostic devices in uh, old and middle countries called the Assured Standard. The A stands for affordable, S sensitive, S specific, U user friendly, R rapid and robust, E equipment free, and D deliverable to end users. Now by equipment free, uh, they essentially mean without electricity. Um, so uh, on the right is, um, Cepheid, who apparently must have had a pretty uh, good year money-wise, um, just for fun, they built a PCR machine with one of their cartridges into a motorcycle. Um, that's a good way to get to point-of-care testing, I suspect, um, but maybe but beyond the, uh, the means that we're looking for here. So there's several ways to, to think about doing testing without electricity. One is by, there are a various amount of isothermal types of reactions, that is, enzymes that don't need to, to go thermal cycling. And obviously the thermal cycling in these machines is what requires the, or the electrical power to shift from one temperature to the next. Um, lamp is one way to do this. Um, in the top left panel here, it shows that this is a various numbers of primers you have to use to get this kind of rolling circle PCR. You generate so much DNA from this, these are negative and positive controls. This is just shining a wood lamp on it. And then, the, and then uses the ultraviolet capability of DNA to kind of show how much you generate just from this reaction. You can then put it on a self-digitalized device, which basically you pump it in here and the flows into these tiny little cells. And you can use a UV light to see if it's positive or negative. This is an example of a colleague who looked for HIV testing. Um, this is a microscopic image on UV light of this image. This is a cell phone image in a shoebox. You can see it still works in a cell phone image in dim light. Um, these you can use a point of care device in the HIV world. You can do these cards, take a picture of it like this, send it to the cloud and it will tell you the copy number of HIV you have in the sample. We've taken this a step further with some of my engineering friends at the, at the University of Washington. Um, and what they did ingeniously is they found some old CD players. And as you know, this kind of, this is an old CD engine up here that spins around. And so what he made, he made a microfluidic compartment that has a loading cell and then thousands of wells out here. When you spin this, if you load the sample here, it distributes it out to the spots. And uh, I didn't know this, but, but when these things spin, it spins at 150 Gs, amazingly fast. And this essentially, you can basically fractionate the white blood cells and the red blood cells by, by centrifugal force. Now, at first we thought we'd have to break machine and then clean up this, but it turns out you can do dilution experiments and you can put just blood in water and still get an amplification by these robust PCR systems. So this is just a curve of amplifications with uh, no blood fluorescence and 1% blood, 10% blood. Once you get 10% blood in water, you, you get poor amplification, but 1% you can do it. This, this shows these panels here where these things are lighting up. These are all positive signals. And what this is here, is doing triplicates of samples uh, that are done by three different methods, one by conventional PCR, uh, one by Cepheid, and one by this, this digital system. You can see they actually are quite close over six logs of, of, of uh, dilution. Um, so this is a way that we think we can get a robust PCR machine, not only for BCR able, but for, for pretty much anything you want a PCR, um, and, and do it uh, in a system that doesn't rely on thermal cycling, and can, doesn't even rely on nucleic acid extraction. So on the left is even going one step further. This is a, a, essentially a pregnancy test for BCR Abel, um, where you pay, take RNA and in the reaction, re reaction mix, push it in here and it passively flows in this device. This is the control band of junk. This 21 is the BCR Abel fusion gene. Um, this only takes about 20 minutes. Um, doesn't need any uh, ample uh, um, thermocycling, so you again can do it at pretty much room temperature. Um, the issue here right now is that you, you have to do this on extracted RNA rather than just cells, but we have an idea for that. This is um, Erwin Bethier, who runs a company called TASA. We're doing a experiment with him basically extracting DNA to this device, which when you push that red button, 
um, 500 microliters of RNA goes into this device, or DNA blood goes into this device, where it's kind of put on a spot of paper, as, as I showed before. Um, we can also do it in a lysis buffer. So what we're trying to do now is do this, have it go directly into a lysis and amplification buffer, and then you'd plug that into this device, and you'd be able to detect uh, be cerebral with the point of care. Now, getting back to the first slide I showed with the life expectancy in the US, um, this is an example of patients uh, on the Max Foundation um, protocol where they're getting the, the free tarps and kinases. It just shows the phase of disease they're in, what drug they're on, what area the country is are. So this is 15,000 cases, I think now with a transition to India and the like, the Max is taking care of more, which 60,000. But the significant thing is this, these are patients' survival of patients treated with CML as first-line therapy in these various regions. And you can see that 10, 15 years out, the patients on this program are doing the same as in the United States. So this shows the absolute power of diagnostic testing and monitoring is that just by getting the patient's drug, you can give them the same experience that if they were in a highly industrialized society. And I think that's just mind boggling news. Um, and I think that's just, uh, it's so hopeful that it's, it's uh, kind of like beyond comprehension for me. So one of the things that we have to think about is in going into to areas or resources, and especially if they haven't been tested or monitored before, um, what do we do? We can't test everyone. We've done a, a basically a, a paper looking at how much the need of testing in these countries would cost, and it's millions and millions and millions of dollars of testing if we, if we did it on everyone. So we have to be thoughtful about how you do it. And I think some of the things to consider is, is it's probably, given that you have good resources, probably important to concentrate on early monitoring because we know from many studies, um, you know, if people do fail to go into a res good response, especially for progression, you can usually pick that up in the first you know, three to six months. Uh, so those would be to identify people who might need um, even more frequent monitoring than when someone is not responding quite fast. Um, things like SOCO score might push you to a little bit more frequency monitoring. Um, you could, once you started patients on, you could do reflex monitoring only if clinically indicated, like watching the white blood cell count, that's probably a little late, but, but if you have limited resources, that's one thing you could do. Um, and I think realistically, you have to think about for these long-term survivors, um, do we need to test them at all? And if so, how frequently? If you're looking at people who have survived 10 years on tyrosine kinases, they've probably got a pretty good response and they're probably gonna need a lot of monitoring. Um, but you might want to do one test and look to see how deep they are because this might be the potential for, for TFRs, which could obviously save the system quite a bit of money. And now the Max Foundation has started the pilot of a, of a TFR in, in three centers. We're watching this very carefully to, to make sure this goes well. Um, but if this is a possibility, then we might have a strategy of going forward. And I think that we have a few mathematicians in our group who are looking at longitudinal studies that we have peculiar data with the idea that if we know how fast someone went into a response and how deep they are, you know, we can probably uh, you know, build an interesting algorithm on which patients really need careful monitoring and which patients don't need much monitoring at all. So with that, I'll uh, to leave you and look forward to talking to you uh, during the discussion session. Thanks.